Man, go ahead and take a seat. I'm so glad that you are here today. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 7. We are continuing in our Son of God series. And for the rest of the year, we're going to be preaching through the Gospel of Luke. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, you are invited to use one of the Bibles under the seats in front of you, and you'll find Luke chapter 7 on page 1026. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, if you don't have a Bible to bring to church, we want to invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. No longer call it Calvary's Bible, call it your Bible, write your name in it, uh, put the date that you were given it if you want to, but make it your own. And the only thing that we ask you to do is begin to read and apply his word. At Calvary, we really believe if we read God's word and we apply his word, he will change our lives. Uh, one, we've been living here for now about, uh, about three and a half years. And one of the things that I love about Calvary is how we serve all the schools in Lake Havasu and in Parker. It's really a really cool thing to see. As a church, we have Calvary Christian Academy, uh, but we don't just serve our own school. We focus on the other schools in our district as well, whether they're private schools or public schools. We serve any school that would let us serve them. And that is really rare because a lot of times what happens as a church gives birth to a school, they focus exclusively on their academy and they begin to lose their focus outward. And I love how Calvary not just focuses on Calvary Christian Academy, but also on the rest of our schools as well. We serve teachers and administration with, uh, with breakfast, with lunch. We serve on their campuses by providing landscape or light construction duty. It's really cool to see how Calvary gets involved with our community several times a year. We love serving teachers, and I love that. My wife is a teacher, and teachers have it rough. I know because I was once a middle school boy. I know the pain in the behind that I was to the teachers that I had. Uh, When I went to middle school, paddlings were used as a way to keep the kids in check in the classroom. Raise your hand if you remember paddlings. Or raise your hand if you remember switches that the teachers would use. That that dates me, right? That's, That's going back some time. But the teachers would paddle the students that were misbehaving in class so that the rest of the students would learn. They called us guinea pigs. We were the guinea pigs. We were there. We got paddled. The rest of the students sat up straighter. At least once a month, the sound of a student, one of my peers getting paddled in the hallway would reverberate throughout the classrooms. We would all hear somebody's tush getting hit with a big wooden paddle. Uh, We called it in school, we called it three licks with a stick. Like we would get three licks, one lick, two lick, three lick for doing things wrong. Now it wasn't the first correction to our behavior. It was usually a last resort. I was paddled by every one of my homeroom teachers at least twice during sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, The principal and the vice principal often got in on the action a little bit as well. I was paddled for fighting. I was paddled for cussing. I was paddled for telling my teacher to shut up. Seriously, (laughs) that's what I did. I interrupted her and told her I heard that story before. I was paddled for spitting spit wads, running in the hall, passing notes, and chewing gum. Not because I was a first time offender, but because I was a repeat offender in my school. I was even paddled, this is embarrassing, I've never said it out loud before. I was even paddled for peeing on the floor in the boys' bathroom. (laughs) I was a bad kid. I was not well behaved at all. In many ways, I was an idiot. I made poor choices during my academic career in middle school. So out of curiosity, I'm just curious if you remember your teacher using a paddle. So raise your hand if your teachers in your school used a paddle when you were growing up. 
Raise your hand if you got a piece of that action a couple times. All right, thank you. Back then, the teachers didn't stop paddling with just the three licks. If I still had a smile on my face, they would always have a teacher standing beside them like their wingman. Then the wingman would take over and I'd get another three licks. I would get paddled until I stopped smiling. If I thought it was funny, I was doomed. So this past January, I I challenged our church family and I challenged myself to begin to radically serve in the public school system as a substitute teacher. Did you know that every day in Lake Havasu City, we have a need, we have a need for substitute teachers almost every day at Calvary Christian Academy, but guaranteed every day in our school district, we have a need for teachers in our classrooms. And I'm intentional about using the word we. Whether you have children in the school system or not, the community that we live in is impacted every single day by teachers, by bus drivers, by maintenance workers, by administration, by school staff, on a daily basis. And our community is also impacted by you. Because we live in this community, whenever we talk about the high school, whenever we talk about the middle school, whenever we talk about the elementary school, CCA, or other schools in our district, it is never a they thing. It's always a we thing. The education system is a we thing. It always has been. It always will be. In fact, did you know that the church is the one that actually began the education system in America? Students used to learn how to read using a Bible because that was basically the only printed book they had available. But it was still one of the major influences that helped shape the education system back then, back in the day, was the church. We, as a church family, we as community members need to stay involved, we need to be aware, and we need to believe that you and I can make a difference in our community by changing the mindset from a they or them mindset to a we and ours. That is our high school, whether you have a child there or not. That is our, those are our middle, that is our middle school. Those are our middle schools. We have private schools and public schools, but they all belong to us because we are also part of the community. And every day there is a teacher shortage here in Lake Havasu. Every day, our teachers go home discouraged and tired, oftentimes because there are not enough substitute teachers, so they're having to cover double duty and and work in two or sometimes three classrooms as the teacher for the day. Every day, our students, our students are hindered from learning because a substitute is not available and, and teachers are scrambling. For example, this fall, there are 72 job vacancies posted already for our school district. 72 jobs are available this coming fall. See, that's a we thing. That, that's a we problem. If those positions are not filled, teachers and students, families are going to be negatively impacted. We are going to be negatively impacted. And I love that at Calvary, we don't view ourselves as separate from the community. We belong to the community that we live in and we believe we have a a responsibility to radically serve in our community. We've got to be willing to view our neighborhoods and our community the same way as a man in scripture viewed his community. We're about to read the story of the centurion who wanted healing for his servants, so he reached out to Jesus. But there are some life-changing things inside this passage of Scripture. And it's so life-changing that I'm convinced whether I deliver this message eloquently or not this weekend, I believe that God can use this message 
as one of the most important messages that I've ever preached here in Havasu about the need for us to be involved and in serving inside the school system. I, I, I'm just convinced of that. To the Jewish people, the man that we're about to read was an outsider. In fact, he was a well-trained killing machine, and his role was to keep the Jewish people in check. Based solely on his occupation, based solely on his race, the Jewish people wanted nothing to do with him because of who he was, because of his identity. But as we're going to read in this passage, he was a little different than the other centurions around him. So let's read together Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed." For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who, were, who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Now, you might be asking yourself, as I read that passage of scripture, what on earth does this have to do with us radically serving in our community? Well, I'm about to tell you. The Roman people, or the Jewish people, wanted nothing to do with the Roman government. They hated the tax collectors because the tax collectors took, uh, took from the Jewish people and funded the Roman government. They resented Rome, and they hated that these Jew, uh, these Roman soldiers were there as an occupying force inside of their territory, inside their land. They hated that Rome occupied Jerusalem and the Roman government really kind of served as a reminder to the Jewish people that they'd been at, held in captivity for years and years in Babylon, that they'd been held in, that ki in captivity by the Egyptian people. But Rome was organized. I mean, they had political leaders, they had soldiers, they had power. And so the Jewish people didn't have the strength to revolt against Rome. So they reluctantly lived with the occupation of the Roman guard. And because of that tension and that anger, a Jewish person would never, ever be caught with their foot inside the house of a Roman officer or a Roman guard. Uh, they wouldn't sit at the dinner table. They wouldn't be seen with a Roman soldier, especially one that was in charge of over 100 soldiers. But Jesus knew that hate-based values cannot produce life change. Jesus, Jesus knew that even though the Jewish people hated and resented those Roman soldiers who were there occupying the land, he knew hate-based values could not produce life change. Now, up until this passage of Scripture, Jesus had never healed anybody outside the Jewish faith. Every leper, every person that was diseased, every person that was blind, lame, deaf— all of those individuals had been Jewish up until this moment. Now, it's not because Jesus was a racist, because he wasn't. Jesus didn't hate people based on uh, because of their culture or because of their background. It wasn't because Jesus was not willing to cross religious or ethnic and cultural backgrounds either. The reason why Jesus had not yet healed anybody outside the Jewish faith is because nobody outside the Jewish faith had asked Jesus to heal them. 
And nobody had demonstrated that they believed that Jesus could heal and that Jesus could transform. In this moment, Jesus was willing to go against the culture. He was willing to go against how he was raised, those hate-based values of resentment, because he knew people outside the Jewish faith needed to be transformed by the power of grace. They needed to be transformed through the loving hand of God. And just as an aside, just to make sure we're all clear, hating people because of the color of their skin or their culture or their religious views, even if that's the way you were raised, it's wrong. It's evil. And Jesus was not going to limit God's love and grace to only the people that looked like him, that voted like him, that spoke like him, or prayed like him. And Jesus wasn't the only one who refused to allow hate, intimidation, or fear to control his life and to dictate how he lived. Both the centurion and Jesus demonstrate ethnic cooperation. That, that's what we see in this passage is the centurion demonstrate ethnic cooperation and Jesus demonstrated it. Note some of the things that the Jewish elders had said about the centurion. They, they asked Jesus to heal the servant and then they provided reasons to Jesus. They said, hey, Jesus, he is worthy. He loves the Jewish nation and he even used his own resources to build a synagogue for the Jewish people. The centurion was in charge of over 100 Roman, or 100 Roman soldiers. He was wealthy enough to pay for a synagogue to be built. This was a man who could have been feared by the community. He had wealth, he had power, he had authority, he had influence. He was a tough man. He was trained as a warrior, but instead of using his influence to bully the community, instead of bullying others and forcing his will upon other people, instead of using his influence to get his way, this centurion used the influence that he had to bless the Jewish people. He loved their nation, he built them a synagogue, I mean, he built a church for them, for crying out loud. He crossed ethnic boundaries. He crossed that unwritten code of conduct. He crossed lines of racism. He crossed lines of hate to bless a people who were not like him. He had a tender heart for the community. He looked around at the Jewish people and he made a decision to improve the community that he lived in. He used his wealth and his power to bless the lives of the Jewish people and to make them better. I am fully convinced that you and I can do the very same thing with our community. Rather than shrugging our shoulders and walking the other way, rather than giving up on children and teenagers in our community, what if you, not the church, what if you chose to make a difference? And one of the ways that you can cross cultural boundaries and cultural influence and influence of, of, of people not like you is by serving at Peach Springs, uh, on Peach Springs mission trip uh, this next uh, week, this Tuesday. They're going to gather here at six o'clock and they're gonna go out and they're gonna serve all day long and they're gonna come back and they're gonna help them celebrate their end of year school uh, closing with a big carnival. That's a great opportunity for you to serve, for you to demonstrate that you want to bless other people not like you. But what if annually, once a month, you chose to serve teachers and you chose to serve the schools by becoming a substitute teacher, once or twice a month, serving inside our school system, choosing to bless a people not like you. And a couple weeks ago, I served our schools. I'm not just standing up here asking you to do something that I'm not willing to do. I served our schools by becoming the bizarro version of myself. I became an eighth grade advanced math substitute teacher for one day. 
One day, Joe Donahue was an advanced math teacher. Let that settle into your heart and mind for just a minute. When I was growing up, I hated math. I resisted it. The moment we started dividing divided numbers, I was lost. Why are we messing with numbers less than the value of one? Let them be. Leave them alone. It never made sense. And we're always taught to round up anyway. So are we rounding up or are we dividing fractions? I don't know. I still don't know. So I got one applause from somebody also that failed math, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So all day long while I'm substituting in this advanced math course class in eighth grade, I had several different periods that came into my room. I felt tense all day long. I was hoping that a student would not ask me how to work out a problem. And I had my answer ready. I had it memorized in my head. All I was going to do is look at their equation that was on the paper and just simply say, you forgot to carry the one and walk away. <laughs> and just let them be as confused as I was growing up, right? That, that was the whole plan, but nobody asked me how to solve the problem. The, the teacher laid out great substitute teaching plans. All I really had to do was manage the classroom. I introduced myself, I took attendance, I, I gave out the assignment, and then I walked around the classroom and pretended like I knew what I was talking about. I had the answer key with me just in case, and I'd say, oh no, that one is incorrect. Here's the correct answer. How did you get that? I don't know, figure it out but I made it through the day. And being there inside the school, I know, and this isn't me patting myself on the back, I'm telling you guys, there is such a great need. I know that because I was there, at least two to three other teachers were blessed that day because they didn't have to do double duty. They didn't have to try to manage their classroom and check in on the classroom beside them. Other teachers went home that day a little less stressed and they went home a little less tired because I was willing to jump through all the hurdles of becoming a substitute teacher for our community. And trust me, if I can be an eighth grade advanced math substitute teacher, you can serve as a substitute in whatever way you want to. You can do it too. I was nervous, I was intimidated, I remembered how I treated substitutes when I was in school. I didn't respect them, I wasn't kind to them, and I braced myself for that. I was ready to be mistreated all day long, and I was okay with it because I knew that my presence there in serving provided relief for other teachers and for the administration and the staff. And we also see, so we see the centurion choosing to look around at the Jewish people and seeing how he can help. And he jumped in and he helped. And we also see from the centurion's example that true faith is marked by humility and authority. True faith is marked by humility and authority. It takes humility to serve. It, it takes humility to get out of your comfort zone. It takes humility to serve a people that we're really intimidated by. If we're over the age of 30, we're all intimidated by teenagers. Uh, I mean, there's not probably a person in here who doesn't take a deep breath when you pass by a middle school and see students being released. Or maybe that's just a mark of a dad that has middle school kids. I don't know. But when the centurion asked Jesus for help, he didn't tell Jesus the good that he had been doing in the community. He could have, he could have went to those Jewish leaders and said, guys, you know how I have been trying to help you. And now it's your turn to scratch my back. You know that I, I built this synagogue. You know that I love you. You know that I maybe look the other way and I don't let our Roman uh, soldiers punish you as severely. He didn't list out the good things that he had done. Rather, he was just humbly doing this. He wasn't a believer. Uh, at least until this moment, he became a believer, right? But he, he didn't practice the Jewish faith. But he was still humble with his actions and chose to serve. And the centurion 
humbly respected the process for an outsider to approach a Jewish rabbi, for an outsider to approach a Jewish teacher. He reached out to Jesus through the proper channels, demonstrating he was a humble guy. He understood that the Jewish people didn't like him. He respected the lines that the Jewish people had created. He sent a message to the Jewish leaders. They made a decision to ask Jesus to help him. And Jesus did. Jesus chose to help him. And they probably thought it was even more respectful that he didn't list his accomplishments and say, this is what I've been doing. They knew his reputation because he had already been serving. He already demonstrated that he had loved the Jewish people and he loved the community. And he went through the proper channels. And I'm praying, I am, I'm praying that God will raise up 25 to 30, a ministry team here at Calvary, a substitute teaching ministry team that God would just put it on your heart to make a difference, to not look the other way, to say, you know what? This is my community, whether you're a snowbird or not. But this is the community where you live. It's the community where you are, and it's the community that God has placed you to make a difference. And if God is putting it on your heart to serve as a substitute teacher, please understand You cannot just show up at the school one day, walk into a classroom and say, I'm the teacher today. It's not going to work like that. There is a very long and lengthy process. There are a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. But if you love our community enough, you're gonna be willing to endure it. And let me tell you, it it was pretty difficult. It was a pretty lengthy process. Every time that I thought I was finished with the process, there was another form, there was another email, there was another reply that was needed. I had to check this box, I had to submit another document. I had to work with the local district, I had to work with the state, I had to work with another organization outside the state and the district. Sometimes they all wanted the very same information. At times it was confusing. And some of the requests that they made, I thought were a little bit ridiculous. But after four to five months, I finally received an email that said, congratulations, you have finished the process to become a substitute teacher. Now just complete these next 16 documents. I'm not kidding. I I wish that I was exaggerating, but that's the email that I received. And so I completed the 16 documents online, had to sign a bunch and read a bunch and check a lot of boxes. And when I submitted that 16th document, I got a pop-up window that said, you're almost done. (laughs) One more form to to, uh, submit, acknowledging that you've submitted all your documents. I'm like, This is painful, but it's worth it if we can make a difference in our community. If you have a heart to serve, demonstrate humility, jump through the hoops to serve. And while you're serving, understand you're serving and be confident because God has given you the authority to serve and love your neighbor as yourself. You know you have the authority to do that, right? You have the authority to love others, to care for others, to show kindness to others. You have the authority to get involved in the school system if you go through the proper channels. I mean, I was praying as I was walking up and down that day in the the classroom, I returned prayer to school. I mean, I'm, I'm walking up and down the aisles just praying. I say aisles, the hall, the whatever it's called, inside the class, and I'm, praying, God, give me victory with every step. Lord, I pray that you would use me. Bless the teachers that are out today. Bless the teachers that I'm helping cover for today. And Lord, bless these kids. If God has called you to serve, he's given you the authority to serve. So serve and serve well and serve joyfully. And if the idea of serving children and students in our school system makes you uncomfortable, let me encourage you, make your comfort zone bigger. 
Make your comfort zone bigger. You are, trust me, I do not belong in a classroom. Can I say that five more times? That is not where I belong. I felt like a fish out of water. And that's exactly where I needed to be. And that's exactly where I needed to serve. When we expand our comfort zone, we can bring hope to other people. Expanding your comfort zone brings hope to other people. If you can get over the things that are holding you back, if you can get over hate, or if you can get over fear, or if you can get over intimidation, or feeling like students are gonna intimidate you, if you can get over that hurdle, you can expand your comfort zone, and as you expand that comfort zone, you're going to bring hope and peace and you're going to be able to bless other people. This man, his servant needed help and he had to get out of his comfort zone to ask Jesus to help. He had to get out of his comfort zone, humbling himself to the Jewish leaders, the Jewish elders and asking them to, to help him. Students have changed, they are different. They think differently than you do. They act differently than you do. But they still need the very same Jesus that you do. And if Calvary can raise up a group of 25 to 30 people, I can't walk you through the process and hold your hand and, and fill out all the forms for you. That's outside of Calvary's hands. But we can provide a ministry that's going to encourage you we can provide a ministry that you can, uh, where we can be praying for you and encouraging each other, uh, de uh, depending upon each other, talking about your day with one another. We can become a place, a source of strength and hope for our community by just simply providing substitute teachers. And if that is something that you are interested in doing, if that's something that you're interested in pursuing, I want to invite you, grab one of those red connect cards on the seat, in, the seat in, front, uh, in the seat pocket in front of you, fill out your information and just write on that connect card, substitute. I'll get that card. I'll begin to pray for you. I'll reach out to you. I'll help you get connected with our district to begin that process of becoming a substitute. And then maybe once every six weeks, we'll gather together our substitute teachers from our church and we'll just encourage each other and pray for one another and invite each other to bless each other through words of daily affirmations, which will be needed. But once or twice a month, can you serve? Once or, twice, once or twice a month, can you use your professional experience to make a difference? Can you use your education to make a difference? Can you use your knowledge to make a difference? And can you use your presence to make a difference once or twice a month? Man, if you do, we're gonna be able to, to continue to minister to our community in ways that really demonstrate radical service. I've never heard of a church doing this but I believe this is something that God is leading us to do. So I invite you to join me. Grab one of those connect cards, fill it out, drop it in the offering box, and let's serve together. Continue to serve together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have, have given us the ability to serve. We thank you that you've given us the ability to uh, to, to call out to you that you've given us hands and feet, you've given us gifts, you've given us personalities, and, and Lord, that you desire us to continue to make a difference in our community. So Lord, we ask that you would raise up leaders, the people around us or the people sitting in our seat right now, that you would raise up people to continue to make a difference in our school system, to continue to make a difference at CCA, to continue to make a difference in our community by serving our teachers and faculty and administration in radical ways of being substitute teachers. Lord, we invite you to do that. We invite you to work. We invite you to change us into the men and women you've created us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.